So, next panel, going to be led expertly by Ryan Moorhart. Ryan has gotten a couple shout outs already. Uh, he is really leading the effort on global health security for the World Economic Forum. For those of you who don't know the World Economic Forum, it's really a forum that brings together the leading business leaders around the world. Um, its most famous manifestation is its event in Switzerland, Davos, every year in January. Uh, but it actually does a tremendous amount of stuff throughout the year. And I would say the last couple of years, we've seen incredible leadership from WEF on this issue of global health security. Um, Ryan, thank you for that, and thanks for leading us on. Well, thank you for the introduction, uh, Sheesh. And thank you. I should say, you know, we noticed we're one of the last panels, so just to take a moment to thank all the organizers for this outbreak week. It's really an incredible undertaking, uh, really well done, and really appreciate the chance to be a part of it. Um, and really a privilege to follow Ron. So thank you, thank you, Ron. But it's an special, uh, especially a privilege and uh, an honor to introduce this panel. And we appreciate that the public-private corporation can be on the agenda. And we're looking forward to hearing from the panel. Uh, but when it comes to public-private corporation, maybe we could set the stage by just sharing three things. First, first thing on public-private corporation with outbreaks is the private sector has every reason to engage in outbreak uh, and epidemics and mitigating the, ri the risk and impact. I think we've discussed for a few reasons why, but I'll tell you just a couple. One, is these outbreaks and epidemics are incredibly costly. We heard a little bit earlier from Larry Summers on, on, on this, but it's that the annual cost of outbreaks seems to be maybe 0.7% of global income, which is on the level potentially of climate change and the risk of climate change. In fact, it is actually striking that broadly speaking, and really maybe at risk of being, speaking too broadly, while we continue to get better at managing the risk and the health risk of outbreaks, and of course important work remains in that regard, but while we continue to get better at managing the health risk of outbreaks, we're seemingly getting worse at managing the economic consequences of outbreaks. For example, we saw in SARS in 2003, with only, really, only 8,000 infections around the globe and 800 deaths, we saw a global cost to the economy of $50 billion. And more recently, MERS in South Korea, with 38 cases, we saw a 41% reduction in travel and, ch and really dramatic changes in consumer behavior across the entire region. So I think it is safe to say that we're past the point where businesses, especially large businesses, can afford to neglect the risk of outbreaks and epidemics. The second thing to keep in mind when it comes to public-private corporation is there are several areas where public-private corporation is essential to effective global readiness. It's non-optional. And we've discussed today, throughout the day, and really throughout even from yesterday, on vaccines. And, and so, of course, medical countermeasures development and deployment is one obvious area of essential public-private corporation, which has justifiably received a lot of attention from this uh, esteemed group over the last couple of days, and really, um, it's been on the agenda. But there's other areas as well where public-private cooperation is, is essential and, and uh, non-optional. That's in areas of pandemic supply chain, which we'll discuss more today. Also in areas of data and data innovations, which we heard a little bit from uh, the prior panel on. And in areas of communications, which we'll hear some in just a moment. In finance, again, which we'll hear in just a moment. Uh, and also, in travel and mobility, which Ron has just mentioned a moment ago. Uh, and I'll just say a note because we don't have a panelist on travel and mobility, travel and tourism. What we've seen with the last couple of responses is that the easiest thing to do has been to close your border or cancel your flight. Not that it's easy, but that's sometimes the most politically expedient thing to do. It, there are several ways that we can make that a little bit harder to do, and you only do it when it's in the right 
in the right time, in the right place. And, and, and that's something I think would be worthy of the, the attention of, uh, of our community, to think about how can we make that a little bit harder to do, knowing that that race to the bottom threatens the response and communities uh, and really the outbreak alike. Finally, on the third thing, third item of public-private cooperation before we introduce the panel, we've already said that businesses need to be engaged for, out of their own interest, out of the economic interest, that public-private cooperation is required. And finally, maybe obviously, that in these areas, these five or six key areas of essential public-private cooperation, some really obvious and simple challenges remain. And even though they're simple challenges, good operationally integrated public-private cooperation is really hard. And so this is where I'm really happy to hand to the panel to talk about what are the things that we can be doing in these spaces where we can uh, find that magic uh, solution for that operationally integrated public-private corporation. So with my pleasure, introducing a couple of the panelists. What I'll do is I'll introduce each of you. Uh, and, then, and then, Mike, maybe I'll put you on the spot and have you come up first. But first, let me introduce the entire panel. Uh, and then we'll, we'll hear from each panelist. And then we'll have a dialogue together. So first, uh, welcoming uh, Maggie Farley, the Executive Vice President of Global Crisis and Risk at Edelman. So thank you for being here, Maggie. Gerard Muchner, Chief of Global Communications Officer at, at Henry Schein. Thank you, Gerard. And uh, Tobias May, Vice President, Global, uh, Global Partnerships at Swiss Ray. Thank you for being here, Tobias. And finally, to come up to, uh, now for some remarks, Dr. Mike Ryan, the Assistant Director General for Emergencies at, uh, at World Health Organization. We've all heard from Mike a couple times. And of course, we hear, hear Mike's name mentioned. But if you weren't here yesterday, you didn't hear uh, Mike referred to as Indiana Jones. So he's not asking us to call him that, but it's, uh, it's starting to take. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Ryan. And uh, this is a Groundhog Day for me. I think I was here yesterday. And, um, so yesterday I spoke to the topic of vaccines for outbreaks in the modern world, and we had two excellent panel discussions uh, moderated after that. One panel spoke on the end-to-end -end issues facing us from vaccine development and delivery and equity. Second, probably more important panel took, talked about the challenges creating uh, community demand, acceptance and trust around vaccines. And it was a very interesting discussion to be part of. Um, today, I think, again, we remember the pain, the loss and the suffering of the uh, 1918 pandemic. We again salute the heroes who worked and saved lives. Um, and I hope we, collectively as a community, can commit to do, doing everything possible to keep the world safe from another high ep impact epidemic or pandemic. In the last hundred years, we've made much progress in this endeavor in terms of understanding disease emergence. You saw that today, developing better prevention, detection, and response measures. And we have recognized, as Ryan alluded to, the broader societal, economic, and political impacts of, of these diseases. So, as I said yesterday, all is well. <laughs> well, all is not well, uh, because are we ready for the next big one? And for me, the resounding answer is no. Um, sometimes when you've got a problem in life, you look in the mirror and you ask yourself some questions. I tend to do that a lot because I make a lot of mistakes in my life. But uh, And so let's see if we look in the mirror and can we answer the questions. Do we have accurate forecasting and prediction of likely pathogens, their origin, spread, and impact? Do we have sensitive intelligence and surveillance systems everywhere in the world to rapidly detect and confirm possible events? Do we have all the capacity at all levels in all countries to rapidly respond to outbreaks and prevent larger scale spread? Do we have the best countermeasures possible in terms of drugs and vaccines? And do we really understand how to implement non-medical countermeasures in confused and panicked communities? Do we have the trust and confidence of our own communities? And are they fully engaged and empowered in the fight against epidemics? The answer to all of these questions, I think, is, as with all human answers, it's kind of a yes and a no. But in my view, it's mainly a no uh, in relation to a lot of them. And one last question. And this is where we come on maybe to the public-private sector. To use the American vernacular as I used yesterday, have we emptied the bench? In other words, 
if we accept that epidemics and pandemics are the greatest threat we face as a civilization, have we mobilized all the ingenuity, the skill, the passion and commitment of all parts of our global village to protect, preserve and restore health, economy and society? Can we answer that question when we look in the mirror? I would argue that we have not. And there are two sectors that we need to mobilize urgently in this regard. Our own communities, everywhere. We have not been successful at building trust, engagement, acceptance and participation of communities. This argument is an argument of the experts and has been for a very, very long time. But we also haven't mobilized our vibrant private sector, everywhere. Some places, yes. Most places, no. The private sector has a stake and a responsibility to help answer all the questions I've asked in the last couple of minutes. We're co-accountable because we serve our communities. Yes, it's clear we have pharmaceutical companies that have a major role to play in pandemic preparedness in terms of the development of drugs and vaccines. Um, but as Mike Osterholm said yesterday, We've yet to come up with a downstream business models that work for the development of epidemic countermeasures. It's a major challenge that needs to be addressed urgently and one that WHO is working with partners on. We do have one superb global public-private partnership, which is the Global Influenza Surveillance System. We produce global vaccines every year for two hemispheres based on the free exchange of risk data, virus data, and, uh, and others with uh, industry to come up with a, uh, an effective vaccine, although we were arguing the effectiveness of that vaccine this morning, but well, that vaccine happens because of a 50-year public-private partnership. Um, our research and development blueprint lays out roadmaps for the products we need. CEPI and others are providing upstream financing. But again, as we said yesterday, the governments need to take leadership in creating the environmental conditions and incentives where such innovation and delivery can occur. Beyond the obvious drugs and vaccines we think about, because very often in our game when we think about public-private partnership, we think drugs and vaccines. Um, there are so many other areas where public-private partnership can be usually helpful. We already have our Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. We have hundreds of institutions working together to deploy people uh, and teams to the front line um, before, during and uh, after epidemics. Sorry, I lost my page. On the private sector side, and this is I reflect on what, uh, what uh, Ryan said, and uh, I know he won't blow his, uh, his own trumpet, but we've been working very closely with WEF, a number of great foundations, UN organizations, and many players from the private sector, including Henry Schein, uh, on an epidemic readiness accelerator, looking at challenges as diverse as, you said, supply chain management, uh, data and IT innovations for forecasting, predictive and visual analytics, simulators, epidemic intelligence, innovative field data capture, communications technologies for risk communication and community empowerment, policies and solutions for rapidly managing regulatory and liability issues, and working with the travel and tourism industry to deliver better risk information. Uh, beyond that, and critically, and this is maybe the main point I'd like to make today, we have a massive challenge of building core preparedness capacities around the world. The capacity to detect and respond to epidemics is not evenly distributed. We are only as strong as our weakest link. A broad coalition is developing around this challenge, and we're working closely with the World Bank, with the GHSA, Resolve, many other foundations, and the private sector to try and make the vital progress we need to make. So all in all, we have a massive challenge. Uh, even if we are to respond to the outbreaks we face every day. And in some senses, these are the, I think someone said it before in the previous thing, there is no peacetime anymore. There's no peacetime to build the weapons to defend ourselves in wartime. We're at war. We have cholera. We have, we have monkeypox. We have lots of fever. We have outbreaks. At one point, 12 weeks ago, I think we had eight of the diseases on the, on the priority pathogens list actively causing outbreaks in one part of the world or the other. The only thing we didn't have, I think, was disease X. And I was waiting for that one. So there is, if there is no peacetime, we're challenged every day. We must use these challenges. We must leverage these to develop the products, the systems, the networks and capacities that will serve us well uh, in the future when the big one comes. Uh, I've said yesterday that I've been accused 
of being a pathological optimist. Well, my staff think I am anyway. <coughs> uh, I wear this badge with pride. But I also contend I'm a pragmatic realist. I just believe that we can achieve so much if we just recognize the scale of the challenge and work together relentlessly to find the solutions. I quoted JFK yesterday, uh, and today I'll vote by my grandfather would have been very pleased, great Irish American. I'm now going to quote Winston Churchill. He's turning in his grave as we speak. <laughs> um, but he said, a pessimist is one who sees the difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist is one who sees the opportunity in every difficulty. Thank you.